Hi there. Welcome to episode three of Hogfish Resonance. In this episode, I will be speaking with Maria Brea, soprano. As a child, Maria learned folk music from her quattro playing father. And today, this Juilliard graduate has been dazzling audiences with her incredible vocal range and lush tones, performing on some of the world's most prestigious stages, including Carnegie Hall, the Metropolitan Opera, and Palais Garnier, just to name a few. And most exciting to me, because it's one of my favorite books and films, in June 2023, Maria made her debut at the Metropolitan Opera in the American Ballet's production of Like Water for Chocolate. Maria was a resident during Hogfish's inaugural 2022 summer residential season, and then also returned to perform in the 2023 end of summer show, Carmen X. Here's an excerpt of Maria playing the role of Lucia in Hogfish's 2022 rendition of The Magic Tree. I had the opportunity to have a couple of casual conversations with Maria while she was here in Maine. And in addition to being an incredible singer, as you just heard, Maria is just generally a wicked, cool, lovely human being. So it was such a pleasure to get to chat with her for this interview, to learn more about her operatic origin story and her experience as a hogfish summer resident. She has so much wisdom to share about her experience creating a work of art in an environment of respect and mutual support. And she also had some really useful practical advice for audience members who maybe haven't enjoyed opera so much in the past, but who would like to start diving more deeply into it. I'm so pleased to be able to share our conversation with you. This is Hogfish Resonance. I think when we talked last, we were talking about tattoos, right? Yeah, we were talking about tattoos. I haven't gotten it yet. Um, there is this amazing Fer Tattoo is her um, handle. She's Mexican and she does sort of like these tattoos that are based on cesteria, which is like, um, I don't remember how you call that in, in English, but it's so unique. The orchid is the national flower of Venezuela. And I've always wanted to, wanted to get an orchid with Wayu symbols, which are the indigenous people that live between Colombia and Venezuela. And I just been always fascinated by the culture of the Wayu people in, in my country, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm of native heritage, uh, of indigenous heritage. It wasn't really passed down to me because in Venezuela, all indigenous, like majority of the, the tribes and the indigenous people were massacred by the Spanish. So it's not an option for me to really know what indigenous tribe my ancestors came from but just kind of like knowing the ones that are still there living thriving and doing it's just sort of like um i don't know like a little bit of a connection yeah well as a fairly highly tattooed person myself i know that feeling of getting like just the right tattoo i love your tattoos oh thank you (laughs) thank you Yeah, so this is a great segue to jump in with some questions about your background. Can you tell me a little bit about where you come from, both your personal background and your operatic origin story? So I am from Caracas, Venezuela, but I'm also of Trinidadian heritage. My grandmother came from Trinidad before my mom was born. So I grew up with those two cultures. I didn't learn English, like Trinidadian English or the Patois growing up because I think it's very common for second generation for that to be lost. So since my mom was first generation, she she does speak um, like a Trinidadian Venezuelan English. Yeah. Uh, 
is really sweet. So I, I do not have that. I just have, I guess, a Venezuelan accent when I speak English. And my whole family played instruments. My great uncles and my uncles, they all played music, popular music, Caribbean music, guitar, cuatro, which is our one of our traditional instruments, was always being played. So music was always around. It's really part of my, my upbringing. And I grew up in a slum, in a favela, um, in Caracas. It's called Los Frailes de Katia. It's, it's sort of a dangerous favela. We didn't get mail. For example, mail was not delivered there. You had to walk to throw away the trash. Not the most comfortable, mm. not something that um, you would find necessarily in the U.S. It's sort of like its own picture. Um, but there is a beauty in that. I saw horrible things that I would rather not say, but I also saw kindness and families and unitedness. Because our family background is so strong in music, my dad always brought music from everywhere. And one day for a project for computer science in school or computer lab, my dad um, brought a CD of Bach cantatas and I fell in love with it and I was 11 and I knew that I wanted to be an opera singer. Like that was the first time I was like, I want to be an opera singer. Nice. <laughs> I was like, that's it. Really nice. <laughs> that's what I want to be. I love those moments in life where you just find that thing that makes you feel like, oh yeah, this is it. This is the thing. And especially I would imagine, and please do tell me if I'm off base here, especially when you're living in a situation that is maybe less than comfortable to find that thing that makes the world feel like a beautiful place and a comfortable place it must have been amazing yeah it was really amazing music in general i think um i just think that it kept us safe and i think that it also gave us a sense of culture and perspective that i don't think other people had at that time I'm, I'm very grateful. In a way, we were very rich. I love this idea that music kept you safe. Can you say more about that? With, with the music being such a strong element, I think it kept my sister and it kept me safe from maybe doing things that wouldn't have been so good that ended up happening, happening to some of my colleagues. Some of my colleagues from school are not longer with us as they got in the gangs and some of my colleagues get pregnant at age 14. Some of them got pregnant as early as 12. Um, you know, the it's it's rough. It's it's not pretty. The barrio, as we call it, because in Brazil they call it favela, but we call it el barrio. The barrio can be can be a lot. It can, you know, you can end up in, in bad steps. You can end up being in being in love with a gangster, and you end up dead yourself you know like that could have been something that happened you know but we had music and music was something that we were focused on I am so lucky to have gotten the scholarships that I did and to have you know further down won some of the competitions and start my career to be able to help my family and to be able to to help myself you cannot help others until you can help yourself so I think music saved my life beyond keeping me safe you know So at 11, you fell in love with opera. And how did you get to New York and where you are now? Well, I went to the Escuela Superior de Musica Jose Angel Lamas. The school was founded in the 1800s, and it was our very, very first school. And it's free, and you don't really get a degree. It's 10 years to be able to graduate like in the old times where you just go and study piano for 10 years and you just get a diploma that says you're, you're a concert pianist now. <laughs> From what ages? What, what 10 years of age did that span? That's a great question. Actually, you can start at any point and anyone of any age is welcome. So you can be aided, but it's 10 years, 10 years. You might be 80, 90, you're welcome. You can take the classes, but in order to have a degree in your instrument and be an expert, you have to do this 10 years. Well, I'm going to use this whenever my students complain about four semesters of graduate school. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> that's nothing. I only did 
five years. I only did five years. Yeah. Still, that's that's an investment in time. So then, where did you go after the school? I graduated and started music education in the one of the universities, which is um, like a public university of um, in Venezuela, which is also free of tuition. And then I continued in the conservatory. So I was doing both. I had no days off because I was doing two degrees, basically. And at the age of 19, when my grandmother passed, my teacher and I had a conversation. And she said, you got to quit the university and you just got to focus on this. And then one day she called me. She was like, you know, why don't we look into New York? And I'm like, yeah. She was like, you know, maybe there are conservatories there and they might have scholarship. So we decided which one I could apply for because I was going to only have money to apply for one because I didn't have money. Back then, the, the government had already installed a limit on access to currencies. So we didn't have free access to currencies. So it had to be through a credit card that was approved. And my dad like got his approval and then through that I think for online it was like only allowed a hundred dollars per card and then his friend like gave us the rest I think it was like a hundred ten and then for sending my grades um, I use another friend's card and then little by little I kind of like collected the whole thing and sent my application to Manhattan School of Music I really blindly just did it I was learning English because again second generation my my mom did not teach me English and my uncle rest in peace who was a teacher English teacher and who had been born in Trinidad taught me English he came twice a week at my home and he taught me how to speak English and I owe him that because I I learned from him and I did all my applications I sent my TOEFL again paid with another different car for that. <laughs> this is a real team so, effort it was team yeah it was I'm forever grateful for my community because they showed up for me for that. And I got the, um, so I got my recordings in a museum that my teacher um, found in, it, it was called the Keyboard Museum. And then she filmed me with her camera, you know, and we sent the recordings. And then when they said that I could go, um, we all together like found a way there was uh, an organization that helped me pay for the ticket to fly um I was lucky that one of my cousins um my Trinidadian cousins worked for one airline and he um he bumped me to first class I mean my first class my first flight was in first class and they were offering me food and I said no because I wasn't sure if I had to pay and you know I was oh, really yeah. there was this lady next to me and it was my first flight I it was fine now I fly all the time and it's like silly but it's just, you know, I, I just didn't know. Yeah, yeah. Um, my uncle had just passed, the one that taught me English for oh. that week of auditions. It was... That must have been hard. It was hard. He was coming the two days before I was flying to make sure that my English diction was okay for the song that I was offering in English for that audition. And he had taught me English. It was, it was a lot because, you know, the trip and him meant all together a lot. Like we had done it we had done it together, you know? Um, so I went, I did my audition and I got the acceptance. It was almost a full scholarship, but I had to pay for insurance and for food. And that re at that time, I didn't know that you could appeal for scholarships. I did not appeal. So I just started getting creative and started knocking on doors of journalists. There was this journalist who had a TV show and I wrote to her and I explained to her the situation that where I came from and my grades from school, that I had been the ninth best student of my university when I was in education, that I was a student of Escuela Superior, that I had been admitted in this really important conservatory in the US and that I needed money for food and insurance. And that if she knew of someone that I was happy to teach, come back and to concerts or anything, and she just decided to film in my home. I was really ashamed of her coming to my home. And she said, no, that's where the news are. And then she did come to our house and she filmed this documentary. And a lot of people became interested in my story, an opera singer from a slum. It's not common. And the, um, the family showed up. This was a family you didn't know, right? 
a family I didn't know, a very wealthy family. Yeah, they just said, go, never make up a story, a fancy story. You are who you are. Be proud of being Venezuelan. Always, you know, wear your flag. And that's all we ask from Wow. And that's how I ended up here. I went to Julia. didn't have to pay anything because I got a fellowship there. They paid for absolutely everything from my food to my housing to my studies to my phone. I did my master's degree there. And from there, I started my career. What a great idea to go to a journalist and say, this is my story. How can you help me? I mean, what a brilliant idea. My next plan was going to banks with a folder <laughs> and singing for people. Uh-huh. <laughs> if they were... I just have tons of ideas. <laughs> I love it. There was nothing that was going to stop me for yeah. sure. Like, um, I knew that I had a dream and that I was going to fulfill it and that I was going to find the way, the correct way, the, the legal way to do this. Yeah. But I had several plans. <laughs> so I think in the movie of your life, there's a scene where there's like a montage of all the different ways you thought about making this happen. Like, you know, going to the bank and singing for the journalist singing out in the streets. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. So basically you got to New York and you stayed there. I stayed here. My sons are born here now. I'm a twin mom. My husband was born in Long Island, Man in Manhasset, Long Island, but he moved to Florida and came back. He went to Manhattan School of Music. I met him there. Um, and then we reconnected and ended up getting married. But yeah, New York is my city. I love it here. It's a really cool place to be at. And um, I travel uh, mostly around the U.S., and every time I come back to New York, it feels like home. So I'm dying to ask you about your residency at Hogfish last summer. Well, I guess I should first ask, how did you meet Edwin and Matt in the first place? And then how did that lead you to becoming an artist in residence at Hogfish? So I... So my, my friendship with uh, the Cahill started in 2020, but I had known uh, Matt from an audition that I had done in, um, in, in for Songfest when he was an Alexander Technique teacher in Songfest. He had a good impression of my work. And then fast forward, one of our common friends had recommended me for a show that they were going to do in 2020 before what we all know happened. And I met Edwin. Um, we had a lovely coffee, a lovely chat. We got to know each other and of each other's work and our journeys. Um, I had had my sons and they came over to meet them and told me about um, the possibilities of doing a project and the way it would look, which would be arts to heal, to regenerate, to, to sort of um, just clean up you know, clean, clean your soul through art. Oh, I like that. I love that. I know. It, it was, I was like, let's do it. I mean, I, mean, I just really loved um, the, the idea that they had. And it sounded so differently and so different than other things and like about regeneration and healing through art. And I was like, oh, that sounds so cool because I, you know, we don't do that. So we just kept communicating and checking in. And then fast forward, I think it was... I think March 2022, Matt um, called me and he was like, let's let's do with this. It's going to be a uh, Gluck opera and um, we're not yet sure how we're going to cast it because all the roles might be like completely different in terms of gender because, you know, the name Hawkbitch is it's no gender. And I was like, that's so cool. Um, and then we're going to have dialogue in English and we're going to create some of that together and it's going to be, you know, completely modern and updated. And through that, we we're going to be Alex doing Alexander Technique, which I was like, yes. <laughs> and we we're going to have someone checking on you and we're going to be doing meditation. And I was like, yes, you know, that's what you need. Especially, it's almost like for teachers in the middle of the year. Usually teachers are just done in the middle of the year. Artists feel the same way. You perform the whole season. You went through a lot. You traveled. You met people, um, awesome people. Let's start with the positive, but maybe not so awesome people who bring you down. The industry brings you down. They tell you how horrible you are. And they're telling you what to do all the time. And 
not sometimes for the best reason, but just for control, and it's such a small bubble, and it can be so toxic. The arts can be so toxic, um, and opera can be really, really toxic. So I, you know, I felt like it was just the right place for me to go to to try out something different. Um, you were there for, was it two or three weeks or more? Two weeks. Two weeks. Can you give a kind of paint a picture of what the days looked like while you were there? Yeah, so we didn't start super early, which was so nice, so that everyone could relax. And we would start with group class, where we would do all kinds of different activities. Sometimes we did Alexander, we did observ observation, just being around the room. Um, we did meditation. Uh, we did activities just where we could just, you know, sensorial activities to awaken our senses, which in, in a way it's like part of therapy and healing. We were in nature, which made it's just so beautiful, you know. I never knew that outside of the Caribbean something could be so beautiful and yeah. that the water could be so yeah. beautiful. I just mean you guys are so lucky. Like it's just so it's so perfect. And seeing all the green and feeling all of that while we were doing activities, because we went into the woods and into just nature and, and around and just explored um, different ways of thinking about our well-being. And then also something that I loved is that as the week went on and the first days kind of went on, we also brought our own activities. So all of us brought our own particular um, sort of routines that we do to feel better, which I also loved because I got to know what my colleagues did for their well-being. And, you know, and some of them I keep still. Some of them use some instruments to sort of soothe themselves. Some of them um, did little games. Some of them just sang songs and clapped. I mean, everyone did different things. And I, I just loved it. It was all, we all came together, not just to make a show, but also to heal together as a community. So I'm curious, how did that make you feel? Um, and or how did that influence your performance ultimately? What was that experience like comparatively to um, other methods of arts creation that you've experienced? I've never felt, when we opened, I didn't feel the show. I didn't feel, oh, well, I have to do something special to be in the, you know, in this, we were in the, in the mental place to do that because we were all together and we knew what we were going through and we understood and listened to each other. And I think that's why the shows were so successful. And they were they were, I saw both shows, both amazing. And what a beautiful reflection that, I, at least this, how, this is how I would interpret it. So I'd be curious what you think. You know, it sounds like sometimes the experience of artists is being sort of pushed around by the grandmaster at the, in the front of the stage. So you're, you're pushed around as, as doing objects, objects that do. And it sounds like this gave you an opportunity just to be and to show up as a being being. Yes, absolutely. You are sometimes you're being scrutinized to the point that every single thing that you do is wrong. Um, so it doesn't sometimes it starts from the point of the negative instead of from the positive and then from their building and um, growing from 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 that, from strengthening the person instead of growing something from beating it up and making it like weak. Uh, you know, that's something that that I think is a tradition passed down in the arts of like, you, you know, you, they gotta be strong. So let's tell them how horrible they are so that they work hard, right? Um, and it, this is such an old art form and it comes with like the old thoughts that they have, like of the Mozart and the Bach. Right? Very traditional, yeah. Very traditional. Um, and not necessarily efficient. For me, when I came out of it, I was like, okay, I can live life better as a performer. You know, let me take this. I still do these things, these exercises that we learn in class, particularly when I'm feeling like burned out. And I'm just so grateful. I'm grateful for the tools that they gave, that they gave us. It, it was the biggest gift in the world. It's just to heal artists who are burned out, who feel horrible about themselves and change that into something. No, I feel great about myself and I have independence and I have 
and my voice matters and what I do and how I create it matters. I think it's it's nice to be approaching art from such a modern perspective, from well-being, uh, from building community, from respecting our environment, from respecting, well, and even more importantly, everyone's identities, how they come in their room and how they want to be appreciated, how they want to be acknowledged. I think that's so important. And if art, and particularly opera, doesn't catch up with that, it will just die because nobody can relate to that anymore because it's not about this anymore or the diva. It's about making community because that's what you're going to find. And I think the Cahill's just got it. <laughs> Fantastic. You know, part of my... Well, I, I think part of the reason Edwin and Matt asked me to do this podcast originally is that I'm someone who has had my brain rewired through watching Acts of Beauty on the stage. And so for me, it's just, uh, it, it's sad to hear that while we, the audience, see this beautiful end product, which looks so effortless, that so often there is a shadow side that the performers go through in order for that beautiful transformative experience to happen for those of us sitting in the seats. And what I love about hearing your experience with Hogfish and, uh, you know, about the way Edwin and Matt are so dedicated to this idea of regenerative arts is kind of an affirmation that wouldn't it be a beautiful thing to have audience and performers both be in a kind of transformative ecstatic state uh, to have this experience be beneficial for both sides of the stage. You're right. <laughs> and you just said it so beautifully. I think artists should feel like that when your artist is being treated well and cared for. And uh, I'm, I, you know, I'm not saying, you know, that people don't have to work hard or, or like you don't have to be part of the process or, you know, receive feedback, not at all. It doesn't have to do with, you know, for, for those who are listening, that it doesn't have to do with like us not wanting to do the work or that we were just chilling, you know? No, we were working. We were working really hard, but we were working in a different way. We were working in a way that was benefiting everyone because we were open and we were, we felt safe. And because we were, we felt safe, we wanted to work more and we wanted to do better for the show. Um, so it ends up benefiting, you know, everyone. The companies end up getting a better performance because their artists are happy. They feel heard, they feel respected, um, they feel acknowledged. Because, you know, you're the one who goes on stage. I, I, I usually say that to myself if I'm being in a situation that it's less than, you know, wonderful. I'm like, well, I'm the one being on, going on stage, so. I better believe in this one. You know, I have to have that. But, you know, having a place to go to in the summer or I hope that they can take their work everywhere and teach other companies on how to do this. I think that obviously you, artists wouldn't have to fight so much to find that comfort because you need to believe in what you're doing on the stage to be able to do it. If you feel like you suck, that you're horrible, you won't do a good job. Yeah. Like, it's just, you know, people will think, oh, she's struggling, you know, but we don't know what happened. We don't know what, you know, what went on in that rehearsal. Yeah, it comes, out of, it comes out of fear rather than love and ecstasy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. exactly. Okay, so here's the question I'm asking everyone to comment on for this podcast. What does regeneration mean to you, both personally and professionally? Regeneration is a time to recharge, like like anything. We go to sleep every night so that we can, you know, humans need rest. Like I actually was thinking about it like in a philosophical way. I like, why do we need rest? Like, why is it like, and why is that a rule? You know, <laughs> but we do. So it's it's something that whether we like it or not, we need it, and. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are, there will be a point where you will feel burnout and you will feel tired and you will see a score. And even though it might be the best role that ever happened to you with the best company, you might want to throw up and be like, that's horrible. Like, ah, here we go, another stressful thing. 
So regeneration is a time to cleanse all of that, to rest because humans sleep, um, to be vulnerable in a way that feels safe so that you can do what you're supposed to do. So that, that to me is regeneration um, as an artist and as a human altogether. I actually love what you just said. Humans sleep. <laughs> you know, humans sleep. Humans sleep. It's a thing we cannot avoid whether we like it or not, but we have to sleep somehow every night. <laughs> that's, that's where dreams come from. Yes, exactly. Here's a tricky question. Um, well, let me put it this way. Opera is not necessarily everyone's bag. Uh, it does often seem like, as sometimes is said, either you get it or you don't. You either naturally love it or you don't. How would you coach someone who maybe likes the idea of opera, um, who can appreciate the incredible talent that it takes to hit the notes, like the ones you hit, we heard you hit uh, in the clip at the beginning of this interview, but maybe can't quite connect to it emotionally. How would you, you know, how would you help someone get from here to there in terms of finding a, an appreciation of opera? I think the most important thing, um, besides obviously, I mean, the singers, um, is the story. Um, like, for example, La Traviata is based on, on the book La Dama de las Camellias, the, the Lady of the, the Camellias, right? If they've already read the book and they're, you know, big fans um, of, of, of this literary work, um, I think that could be a way. Or something that is happening nowadays that I really, really love, that operas are being told on people that are not necessarily so Eurocentric, like, for example, Champion, which is being put at the Met right now um, by um, the first Black composer ever to be presented at the Met. Operas that are being told about themselves, usually in like local companies. And those smaller opera companies are writing stories that are about the community, um, you know, like the Latinx community, for example. There are um, There's a mariachi opera. There are many, many shows that can speak to you. And I would say, check out what's going on first around you. Like, what are the organizations that are putting shows around you? And check out what are the titles. Is there a title that calls your attention? Then buy yourself a ticket and go. You know, make it a, a date for yourself. Starting from something that feels known, I think, can help a lot. Um, so that you don't just go to a Wagner opera and then you're there for four hours and then you're like, kill me. What's happening? What are they saying? How much longer? Yeah, exactly. What? Even, like, most classical musicians, some of them are like, I cannot sit through that. I mean, like, I cannot judge someone for doing that. And I think it's important for us as opera singers not to judge people if they're not interested in going to some really long show that makes no sense to them, not just in language, but story. They have no idea what's going on. I think it's nice to find something that um, makes sense. It can be opera. It could be a symphonic work. It could be just a concert, a collaboration. You know, I think there are many ways to get into it. And it doesn't have to be like, I'm going to go to the full show with the full sets. I think I think the introduction to it can be in any way. It could be in a bar. It could be in a cafe. Opera belongs everywhere, not just in a theater. And I think that's that's something that we as artists have to also remind ourselves because it belongs everywhere, and that will also guarantee that it doesn't die. Uh, I love the idea of opera in a bar or in a, I don't know, uh, on the streets. Um, to have it as part of daily life, why isn't that happening everywhere? I know. In New York, we're so spoiled. There are a few bars that present opera nights. Um, and I used to go to one, they closed down, it was Mexican festival, and we would just come in. There was earlier a mariachi band, and then sometimes I sang with them, like some um, Mexican music. And then later in the night, we would have an opera night. And then people would drink and just have a great time. And opera felt not like this uptight thing, but it felt like 
this really beautiful thing that was communal where everyone was like, that was great. You know, that's awesome. Keep singing. And then we would end up with karaoke. That was like the, and the bar was, the restaurant was full and packed of pe with people who would come to this. Um, and I think that's, some people maybe from like the, like very traditional would be like, that's just not it, you know? <laughs> but I think, I think it is. It is. Opera is whatever you want it to be. And and we forget also in the time of Farinelli, who was a very famous castrato, uh, poor dear, I think he would go outside in the streets and compete with trumpets. Like, he would, like, the trumpet would play and then he would compete and and then people would be, like, clapping. Like, you mean holding the note? Yeah, holding the note and clapping. It makes me... And he was a guy who would also sing in the biggest theaters with Handel and, like, he was like the most um, looked after star of his time. Like he was Lady Gaga, like in his time. He was singing in the street, being so cool and getting to everyone and singing opera because opera was cool. And also back in the time before it got serious, right, where we call opera seria, people will go to the opera and sell stuff and get a boyfriend there and people would like flirt with each other. It was a social event. And I think maybe, I don't know, we're too serious right now. Like too serious in a way, yes, we need to take it seriously. Yes, it is important. Yes, what we do is valuable. But why does it have to be so inaccessible? It doesn't have to be that way. Right. It really pushes people away. Yeah. And I get it. I just get it. I love your advice to go in already knowing what you're getting yourself into. I think that is simple but um, profound, taking the time ahead of the show to read the story, to read the playbill. I don't know, maybe find out a little bit about the actors, just anything to take the load off of having to do all that heavy lifting of interpreting what's going on on the stage while you're watching it and would be getting you halfway there. Yeah. Speaking of storylines, uh, this brings me to one of the primary questions driving the focus of this podcast which is how can art makers develop more inclusive stories to address the challenges of our current era? That's a really, really good question. Um, I often actually sit in panels in Opera America to talk about this because I co-created a platform with a few friends called Latina Women in Opera and that's exactly like was our mission. Uh, we stopped because it was just so hard with life but what we did, I think, was really important and it motivated a lot of conversations. I think that because opera was born in Europe and classical music, as we see it, West, this Western form was born in Europe, the stories that are being told are based on European stories and European characters, misinterpretations of other cultures. Um, but just to kind of like, you know, answer the question, I think that what we're seeing now is the same thing. You know, we live in a time that slavery is not okay. We live in a time where people move, well, not yet freely throughout the world as for as freely as they can. We live in a time of human rights. We live in a time of mental health. We live in a time of technology, of AI. We live in a different time. And I think that it is a given that we will taste, tell stories about the people who are living in these times. And whoever thinks that, you know, particularly in the, in the US where we live, it's a melting pot. Stories about all kinds of people from all kinds of backgrounds should be told in the story, in, in, in the stage of all kinds of gender identities and, you know, paths and walks of life. I mean, if you, I, I often, for the people who, think that it shouldn't, it shouldn't be like that I ask them like why like you don't want the stories of your neighbors being told like you're basically you would have told Mozart don't write about the aristocracy right do you feel like the needle is moving at all in terms of representation in opera I think so I think so particularly in the U.S. I my experience with Europe is different Europe is such a weird thing especially going country by country um, a lot of them think that 
Americans are crazy, but like <laughs> Europeans who have like, because they don't see me as American, even though, you know, like, well, I'm like, I've been here for a while. Yeah. So my views might be a little bit different. Um, they think it's it's okay to keep certain practices like painting people's bodies darker or making their hairs you know things that we would find here because of the history of this country and the history of america and you know enslaved people um how we view things and i think um maybe here i think there's a lot of effort into this change and that obviously it won't be perfect because there is no perfection we're all humans we're making good things we're making good steps there's also things that are being done that maybe are not great um and that little by little we'll find it but i think that the fact that the conversations are happening i think that's already a good thing it's fantastic so, after this Maria, thank you so much for taking the time to hang out and talk. This, these conversations really give me the opportunity to kind of like draw back my own blinders about what regeneration means, what inclusion means, and, you know, uh, what art means, really, and what it means to be a, an audience member. And you've said so much about that and more, and I hope to see you back in Maine sometime really soon. Thank you. Very grateful to be in your program. You are such a insightful person, human, um, and it's just been a privilege to have this conversation. I feel like I also had a time to reflect on my thoughts and and hear you also reflect on it and, and feed off of that. So for me, it was, it was beautiful to have this conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That was episode three with Maria Brea. Thank you so much for listening. And if you would like to learn more about Maria and her work, head over to her website, www.mariabreasoprano.com. That's www.mariabreasoprano.com. And as always, if you'd like more information about Hogfish and its programs and offerings, head on over to www.hogfish.org. In our next episode, I will be speaking with Hogfish groundskeeper, Lynn Schaefer. Um, I'll confess, I am a city girl at heart, and when Matt suggested I interview Lynn for this podcast, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. I was even a little doubtful about how to successfully make the connection between the garden at Beckett Castle, as beautiful as it is, and the experience of regeneration through the arts. But of course, now after talking with Lynn and hearing his insights into the role of engagement with the natural world as part of the hogfish mission and vision, I kind of can't believe I missed the relevance. Lots of juicy stuff in that. Here's a clip from my talk with Lynn as we wandered around the Rose Garden at Beckett Castle. When Edwin and Matthew were still first talking about hogfish, I just really admired that attitude of regenerative art, but also inclusion and all of art. And uh, it was really an honor that they would see the garden as a part of that because yes, I see it that way too, but I don't, I never really equated it or as a, as a, a part of the finer, fine arts. Uh, you know, you get dirty, you get scratched up it's it's to me it's about the plants it's not then how how to make the plants work together or show their best um but for edwin and matthew they were seeing more and that was that was really uh, an eye-opener for me for one of the first performance here where there was dance and voice and music of uh, instrumental music and in the garden and it was beautiful beautiful uh, and then towards the end of the performance the they had a period where all of the all of the performers were together and dancing and singing and um, piano and 
it was really this moment where I kind of got it. Where, like, oh, it just felt like the wind was reacting. The wind was moving the trees and the ocean had its own sound and sound and waves. And it was, everything was reacting with itself. And people were too. And there was, there was a, a few seconds, maybe not even, a, maybe it was two seconds, I don't know. It, were, it was like this window opened and you could see that there was, um, that interaction was possible and there was hope and um, just, just the idea of being surrounded by beauty and that humans could be a part of that. Yeah, it was a really, really wonderful, profound conversation. Um, one of my favorites. So I hope you tune in for that. And in the meantime, be well, everyone. This is Hogfish Resonance.